Hi, once again, Distractions Media is raising money to go to Gen Con, a convention in Indianapolis which uh, takes place in August. We will be doing so via a live stream on June 23rd. If you want to find out more details, you can find out at distractionsmedia.com. There's a link that says June live stream. Please check it out and uh, please join us. We would appreciate it. And thank you so much for listening to this podcast and thank you for being a part of it. And now on with the show. Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 77, The Life of Griffith Apgainen, part two. In part one, we covered the disaster of the last dynasty of Wales to establish itself in the face of Saxon, Norman, Viking, and even the Welsh themselves. This inauspicious beginnings hardly spoke well to Griffith Apgainen, and whether he could actually really pull this thing off. As he sat in a cave with his few remaining followers, he must have wondered how he could have failed so spectacularly. Of course, one of the larger comments raised by scholars about the life is that there is a sense that there is a great deal of fictional padding. One scholar suggested that his imprisonment and later escape was to make up for spending a lot of his years doing basically nothing of note. Another scholar suggests later on that this imprisonment may have either been longer than suggested or may have gone on until the Normans desired the removal of uh, the revolt that we'll be discussing later. So with that in mind, let's move on and talk a bit more about how we go from the imprisoned and desolate young Griffith to the king of Gwyneth. So we are still left with the fact that there is a biography that we can work from, that we can look at, that we can examine. And within the Chronicles themselves, we can talk about some of this. Of course, there is coloring by the obvious hero worship and propaganda of these later writers. And of course, the the amazing ability to look back at something after it's already happened and see portent where there was none and... Uh, fortune where there may not have been any and examine these things and look at them and say oh look this is why this happened this is the reason why our king became such a powerful person and why his descendants are so powerful and as we talked about last time that's part of the way you construct a myth and a legend around someone the way you create a founder of your dynasty is to show that that founder is bigger than anything that came before him, that he was able to overcome so many obstacles and achieve his great destiny in the face of these things. So again, kind of reiterating what we talked about last time. But nonetheless, in the story of Griffith at this point, he was a king without a country and a leader without an army, and once more he needed allies. So again, he crosses the Irish Sea and went to the kings of Dublin to ask for help. And eventually, he ends up going to the Hebrides, looking for further assistance from the Vikings. Now, whether he arrived back with an army or not, we don't fully know. The life says he does. There's arguments to say he didn't. And there's a lot of things that go on here that make things difficult. Uh, His arrival back in Gwyneth, if we're to believe the life, appears to coincide with the rise of Cadgawen, Aplethen's rebellion against the Normans and Powys. Cadgawen uh, had been trying for a while to take over the remains of Doithbarth, and this appeared as an opportune time to grab possession of the once mighty southern kingdom. First, uh, Resap Tudor, his ally, was killed by Norman marcher lords, uh, specifically Lord Bernard de Nuthmarch, uh, who then, of course, sent his family into exile, as we know, to Ireland, and ending the kingdom, at least at this point in the process and settling the Normans on the path to the conflict with Powys over the area. With Rhys gone and the kingdom in chaos, both the Normans and Welsh battled for possession of it. 
It was at this time that Cadgoan set his plans in place to start to conquer this area, and also to move his influence from being one of a northern and middle Welsh to a southern Welsh influence. In other words, he wanted to dis. It, it comes across as that he wanted to dispossess the marcher lords of their property, and had obviously found enough power to be able to push his luck on this matter and try and influence what had gone on. Uh, in fact, there is some argument, if some of the documents in the life are be to believed, that Cadgowan found an ally in Griffith, who again was seeking the throne of Gwyneth, and he himself once more needed allies if he was going to be successful this time, because if you remember from the last two instances, he tried and failed. Now with the South largely in the hands of the Normans, and William Rufus caught up in political shenanigans in Normandy and the eventual announcement of the Crusades, uh, the Welsh were on the brink of revolt. By 1094, in fact, they start to push against the Normans in their own way. They start to attack various castles and things. Uh, the Welsh Chronicle describes this by saying, the Britons, in other words, the Welsh, being unable to bear the tyranny and injustice of the French, in other words, the Normans, threw off their rule, destroyed their castles in Gwyneth, and inflicted slaughter upon them. Uh, this leads to the Battle of Coedispis, and the forces of Powys and Gwyneth won a victory that allowed them to turn south and finished the year destroying castles in Dovid and also in uh, Caradigion. These destructions were on a large scale. There was only a couple of castles that survived, including the Pembroke Castle. Um, the Anglo-Saxons themselves were concerned about this in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. The Chronicle itself mentions that the French, whomever they were, were also helping in Wales. Now, this is likely probably, I would assume, Norman or Viking allies of the Welsh, uh, who then helped in this battle and of course in their perception of things may have been perceived as being the real power behind the Welsh uh, resistance. Possibly they could not see the Welsh on their own as being successful or plausibly that these were Normans who fought with the Welsh or possibly again as I said earlier Vikings or others in their pay and that may have been somewhat of the case. As we know, Griffith himself had brought in Vikings on a couple of occasions to try and help him overtake various lands in Wales and to no real good success. So you do wonder if it, whether or not that was still the case. And of course, you do wonder that with the various propaganda going on, whether that's to be trusted. Uh, the defeats of the Normans in this era for about a year uh, were bad enough that William Rufus had to return in 1095 and try and put down the Welsh Rebellion. By this time, the Hugh, the Earl of Shropshire, was attempting to quell the revolt, but it only had small success. The South was slowly, once again, coming under Welsh control. All throughout 1095, they continued to defeat in several battles. King William himself invaded Wales at this point in time, leading a campaign in the autumn of 1095 to try and take back various points in the south, uh, only to fail, it seems. Uh, the Chronicle gives off the an air of frustration over the way the Welsh were using what appeared to be tactics of hit and run, uh, and that they weren't willing to confront William head-on. Effectively, they weren't willing to have a pitched battle and were hiding in the woods or... or trying to get the Norman forces to try and come into the woods and fight them there, fight them in the mountains, fight them in the hills, fight them in areas where the Welsh obviously would have an advantage against what obviously is going to be a superior or at least better armored force, which makes some sense. Well, I don't think you can evaluate the Welsh military on the level of, say, some peasant revolt. There certainly is a sense that they were fighting a battle against a superior force, Castles weren't really their strong point at this point. This was more of a Norman thing to do. Of course, the the building of castles to try and defend large territory was something that they had set up. And even England to that point hadn't really seen. And largely, this may have been part of their problem because they would leave small forces to oversee large territory because these castles were seen as sort of the first step in kind of centralizing 
power and centralizing the control that they had and bringing people closer to the castle for protection meant that they would create linkages with them. In the Welsh case, that wasn't how they had run their governments or run their people for years and years. We've talked in the past about the fact that after the end of the Roman period, there wasn't really a centralized uh, location like there was in England. You didn't have massive towns and cities that were running administratively. And in fact, even amongst the way that the formations of the church were created, they were still based around small villages and small rural areas and not major centers. So you didn't really have the same thing in Wales. So there wasn't a comparable in that respect. And in that way, you would have a different method of fighting and a different way of doing things. It doesn't mean, and as we've said in the past, that the Welsh themselves didn't fight pitch battles, didn't come out to fight pitch battles. I think it's obvious that they did. Uh, certainly they did when they attacked Shrewsbury and Hereford at different points. Um, certainly they've done it in the past. But at the same time, when you're dealing with the king and all of his armies, who are probably professional men, you want to have the best advantage you can get. So obviously this is probably what they were doing. And certainly both sides looked at it as Obviously, one is cowardly, the other one is being somewhat uh, laudable, I guess would be the way I would say it. Uh, the Welsh Chronicle, in fact, called the Normans basically cowards, uh, and that they only wanted to fight in open fields and wouldn't take the Welsh on in woods. So you can kind of see right there that there's a, a translation issue between the two sides where where both were seeing the other as a coward because they wouldn't come to their fighting ground and their specific preferred option when it came to this war. So at the same time, William runs his force into Wales. And much like a lot of kings will find fighting wars in Wales is you just run out of everything. You run out of supplies because your supplies have to go through woods, through mountains, through hills, which can easily be attacked. They can be overtaken. The roads are small. The traveling is difficult. The weather is not always the greatest. Of course, as we all know, the rain would certainly play against easy travel. And because of that, it becomes very difficult to make any sort of headway at times, especially in the north and the west country of Wales, because there is just not an easy path to get there. That's the reason why the Vikings were so successful when they would attack on the coast, because they weren't trying to go deep into the into the communities. They were trying to take on the richer, fatter, easier targets on the edge of the community. And the Welsh didn't have the same system of rivers in the way that the English did, where when the Saxons uh, defended themselves, they used the rivers against the Vikings because the Vikings were super successful at navigating rivers and causing all sorts of problems. Well, a navigatable river kind of ends at a mountain, so you don't have loads of those around that you can use to traverse, especially in North Wales as opposed to South Wales. You know, South Wales is still sort of pastoral, it's flattened places. It's much easier to go up, say, the River Taff, for example, and other rivers around and cause trouble. Uh, you can go into places like Abergavenny. You can go into all of these spots and start to get into the heartland of some of the rich parts of Wales, at least agriculturally. And But in the north, it's a whole different story, and it's a whole different way of fighting. And obviously that's where the difficulty lies for the Normans at this point. This is why they struggle with this area and really will until the time of Edward I because they haven't really got a way of fighting this properly. And, and you can see that because there's been three different times now we've talked about them coming into and attacking Gwyneth and defeating Gwyneth and yet somehow still losing in the end when you look at it because they still have to withdraw. They still have to pull back because... They just can't keep themselves strong enough in the area. And likely what's happening is is that the, the people in that part of Wales are fighting a guerrilla war, which they wouldn't have obviously have called it such, which saps the energy of the invading army. It saps the ability of the invading army to feed itself. And we're not talking the difference between someone who doesn't have a gun and someone who has, you know, artillery and tanks. This is this is basically even technology it's just the fact of how do you use your technology and of course the welsh are using their terrain to their best advantage and you can definitely see that here this is probably the best point in time where we see that where we can see 
obviously that the Welsh are using the terrain to their advantage, and they're talking about it, both them and the Saxons. In one instance, criticizing, in the other, they're talking about it in, in great detail and how wonderful they are because of it. Um, the frustration of the king to reach a decisive victory likely led to him rethinking the strategy and what strategies to use in the future. In 1096, the Normans again invaded and in their own judgment spent a great deal of money and life pointlessly as they once again failed to defeat the Welsh. These two years must have created complete chaos for the people in North and Central Wales as they were invaded time and time again as both sides fought bitterly. And of course we know in this period it doesn't matter which side is attacking, they will pillage, steal, and loot the local area as much as they need to. So they're not just, you know, hitting against the other army. They're also taking your food, your crops, your ability to feed your people to try and feed their armies. And you have to understand that the peasants were probably the true losers of all of these fighting battles and problems because they were just left to deal with the problem and they didn't have the ability to defend themselves, certainly not in that way. Um, this time of Welsh uprising was so bad that Gerald of Wales actually described the only way that the castle in Pembroke survived was that Gerald of Windsor tried to show that his situation was not as desperate as it actually was at the time. He ended up throwing bacon at the Welsh besiegers to give evidence that he had a large cachet of supplies instead of basically throwing the last of his supplies at them. Um, and that he had sent a note to be discovered by the Welsh saying that there was no need to send urgent help because he got he had this he got this only he totally did not have this he was the opposite of that in every way and in fact his situation was so dire that had the welsh realized it they probably could have taken his castle as well um the marcher lords had overreached and even their king was having trouble getting them out of this problem by 1097, things once again turned. This time, Hugh of Shropshire uh, and Hugh of Chester invaded the island of Anglesey. This time, they ran into a Welsh force prepared to fight and apparently seemed to have defeated the Normans. This is a very confusing situation and description. One, because both chronicles are using vague year references that we don't really understand fully. Uh, there's not comparables to make to really understand whether this is true or not. Uh, as well, it seems more like it was a defeat for the Welsh. And the reason I say this is because at this point, their main foes, Griffith and Cadwagon, uh, fled to Ireland. So if their leadership is leaving, and in fact the chronicle, the Welsh chronicle, suggests that this was over concerns of an possible internal Welsh struggles rather than being an English one or a Norman one in this case. So what's going on here? What are we seeing? Well, this is where some of the arguments come up about what exactly is going on with Griffith. Of course, in the life he's seen as being a participant in this story, to being, you know, this is his glorious comeback, as it were. But you get the sense from the Chronicles that that isn't the case. And in fact, uh, Professor Maud uh, makes the argument that instead of it being a great thing and a wonderful thing that he's here, it may have been more of an example of the fact that Griffiths was actually not sent here by his... Viking allies. He may not have been sent here by the combined forces of the Welsh. He may not even have been a, a proper ally to Cadwagon. In fact, there is some argument to be made that not only is Cadwagon the senior partner in this whole process, but he may have been the actual one who was fighting the Welsh, and it was nothing to do with Griffith. The suggestion is made that Griffith may have actually have been released at this point. This may have been the time he was least released from prison. This may have been part of the reason why the Normans attack Anglesey is to set Griffith there as the Welsh uh, leader to try and distract and take away from what Cadwagon had been able to accomplish. Because the reality of it is, up until this point, what we see is a leadership that is very successful, very well thought out, very tactically smart, and very able to command 
and win battles against the Normans who hadn't really been losing battles in England and in Scotland. Here they were definitely losing and here they were definitely struggling. So if you set yet another fox in the hen house, as it were, the chaos that it creates between them and the competition and likely the problems makes you wonder if instead of being set up as an ally, if he's set up to be the thorn in the side of his fellow Welsh king. And the reason why some think that is because if you look at the peace settlement that was eventually agreed to by William in 1099 or around there, it appears that Cadwagon is given it as the senior leader is given control of quite a lot. He's given control of Powys, of course, and he also gets Caradigion. The one thing that's not explained here is Griffith is given Anglesey, but not given Gwyneth. And nobody is given Gwyneth from this point. However, as we'll see, Griffith takes Gwyneth. But why and how that happened is still slightly unclear at this point. And why is he not given Gwyneth? Again, the questions remain. Was he really not the ally that he's made out to be by the life? Was he really not this powerful Welsh friend, but rather somebody who was seeking power, didn't care how he got it, didn't care who he had to make friends with to get it, and was Cadwagon just another person in the way for him rather than being the ally he needs? At the same time for the Welsh things start to change because, of course, shortly thereafter this, William will die and in his place will be Henry I. And the relationship between Henry I and the rest of Britain changes things dramatically, changes how the Welsh evaluate themselves and evaluate others and how the homage that they pay to the English will be measured up. And we start to see the Welsh move from being kings to princes And the idea of a principality starts to take shape. It's not something which was there before. In large measure, the Welsh do not call themselves a principality. They don't call themselves princes of Wales. They call themselves kings. This is a later development which is happening because of what they have to owe the Normans. And the Normans, in the meantime, have definitely put themselves in positions of power. Their strength in Powys as a thorn to them is growing. The strength that they have in the south with the marcher lords has grown. And even though there will be problems and issues later on, there is still this sign that things are not going the Welsh way. And in fact, a lot of what is set in place now is the gentle, slow, unenviable drive towards Norman conquering of all of Wales. And the reality of that is very obvious when you start to look at the map and you start to realize just how far they've been pushed. Keep in mind that what was and is considered to be West Wales is now split, and half of it is now within Marcher Lord's hands. All of the South, pretty much for the last 10 years, has been in the hands of the Marcher Lords. And so one of the biggest kingdoms in Wales, in Doithbarth, is basically neutered and in some cases at points, doesn't even exist anymore. So you have nothing to stand against them, no powerful southern king. All you have is northern kings who are not looking necessarily to what the people in the south think, what the people in the south want, which leads to some of the problems with Nest, as we've talked about in the past. And all of this will combine to create the problems that we'll find especially in the 12th and 13th centuries of Wales, where effectively they're divided, they're bickering, they're competing with one another. And in that, the Normans and eventually what we will call the English will move back in and slowly start to take back over. And we'll see them take over all of Wales eventually. But This is kind of, again, as 1066 really did set the pattern for what was about to happen, this continual slide is very obvious at this point. You can see it coming because every time the Welsh fight, they fight as much amongst themselves as they fight the Normans and the English and the Vikings and whomever else. And this inability to unite, to create 
uh, a lasting peace amongst themselves is what drives the problems and really what hands the kingdom to Edward, as we will talk about later. Uh, because, I mean, let's be honest, the princes of Wales were done over by their own people first and foremost. But again, we'll talk about this later. We'll certainly get into more detail as we're going along. But we're still not done with Griffith Apkinen. We're going to continue to chat more about him, specifically about how his reign into the next century works and how he starts to create what we understand to be the Welsh kingdom of Gwyneth going forward and specifically his dynasty going forward because that's a huge part of this. And it's his dynasty that takes leadership, not Powys, not Doithbarth, not any of the other kingdoms that had existed. It is Gwyneth which leads, and there's a reason for that, and we'll certainly get into it. And one of them, of course, is the fact that Griffith lives till he's 82 in an era when most people did not live past, you know, anywhere near that age. So he had lots of time to, to coalesce and grab power which is something that we'll see a lot more of as we talk about it. But we'll get into that next time. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for following. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can reach me at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. You can reach me on Twitter at Welsh History Pod. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. And if you want to follow any of the other things that we do here on Distractions Media, just go to distractionsmedia.com and we have everything listed that we do and we do quite a bit. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you for joining me today, and uh, have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Edge of the Abyss Creations is a proud sponsor of the Welsh History Podcast, your one-stop shop for unique jewelry, paintings, and other crafty creations. You can find us at facebook.com slash edgeoftheabyss1. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more info, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com. Hi, I'm Mark Majano, broadcaster and Sri Lankan cricket fan. Every week, Estelle Vazu, Devon, and myself will drop several episodes of Sri Lanka on 99.94, keeping you up to date on the latest from the Sri Lankan cricketing world. If you want to know what Hasaranga is up to, where Chabri Athapatu scored her runs, or what Naroshan Dickweller has been discussing behind the stumps, then make sure to watch or listen to Sri Lanka on 99.94. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts, on YouTube, and on the 99.94 app. Join the Shrunken Crooked Conversation and get involved.